Good evening and welcome to You Can't Teach That, Prohibited Concepts and Instruction in Public Schools, a Facebook Live event sponsored by the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change. I am your host and moderator for the event, Dr. Andre Johnson. I currently serve as an Associate Professor of Rhetoric and Media Studies and the Scholar in Residence at the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change right here at the University of Memphis. We advance our mission here at Hooks by teaching, studying, and promoting civil rights and social change primarily through education, research, innovative campaigns, and community engagement. For more than 20 years, the Hooks Institute has developed an impressive track record of educating, engaging, and empowering the community. We invite you to go to our website at memphis.edu backslash Ben Hooks to discover all of the wonderful things we are currently doing. We also ask you to follow us right here on our Facebook page, go on over to our YouTube channel, as well as our Twitter handle at Hooks Institute for more information about upcoming events and things that's going on around the Hooks Institute. Now, don't worry, if you forget any of this, no worries, not a problem at all. You can just go to the comment section right here on Facebook and get all of the information. Links will be provided, and we hope that you follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on our YouTube channel as well, and stay in touch by going to the web page and signing up for our newsletters and all the information that you can receive at Hooks Institute. On May 23rd, 2021, Tennessee passed a law banning 14 concepts in instruction that appear to significantly limit how educators can teach students on the issues of race, class, gender disparities, and privilege in public cl school classrooms. Now, how will this law be implemented? How would it impact the quality and scope of teaching? What relationship, if any, does it have to critical race theory? Now, to answer these questions and address issues surrounding this topic, we have assembled a great and awesome panel for tonight. Now, I'm telling you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead on and introduce the panel and just move out of the way so we can have time for their awesome presentations and some time left over for our question and answer period, because we feel that you will have some questions or you really want to make comments. And you can do that in the Facebook comments section. We will try to get to as many as we possibly can before our hour is done. So we hope that you hang in there with us. And if we don't get to your question, no problem at all. This will be shown again, not only on our Facebook uh, page, but also on our YouTube page as well. The first panelist, is Daphne McFerrin. Daphne McFerrin is the executive director of the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change. Since becoming the director, she has built alliances with local and national institutions, businesses, and community organizations to advance the Hooks Institute mission of eradicating racial, social, economic, and other disparities in Memphis and in this nation. McFerrin has significant expertise in navigating statutory and regulatory environments. She was a practicing attorney with the United States Department of Justice 
a trial attorney, federal programs branch in Washington, D.C., assistant United States attorney, District of Maryland, counsel to the then Attorney General of the United States, Janet Reno, and Senior Counsel, Office of the General Counsel, and the United States Securities Exchange Commission. In December of 2016, McFerrin was named one of the 100 women to watch in the United States by Beers Women's Journal. Welcome, our Executive Director of the Hooks Institute, Attorney Daphne McFerrin. Dr. Courtney Malden began her career as a K through four elementary educator specializing in teaching methodologies that support bilingual learners and later served as a literacy interventionist. While teaching in the classroom, she cultivated professional learning communities for teachers that focus on developing culturally responsive classrooms and building a culture of belonging for all students. After her time in the classroom, she continued to train and develop pre-service teachers and school leaders in culturally responsive pedagogy and achieving socially just outcomes in schools. Dr. Malden received her PhD in K-12 educational administration with a specialization in urban education at Michigan State University. She is currently an assistant professor of teaching and leadership in the School of Education at Syracuse University. Please welcome Dr. Courtney Malden. Dr. Latrice Donaldson is an assistant professor of African-American and U.S. history at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi, and a Hooks Academic Research Fellow. She earned her PhD in African-American history from the University of Memphis and her BA and MA in history from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Her research centers on the lives of African-Americans in the military and how gender and masculinity help shape and reshape the narrative of, black, of the black military experience. She is the author of Duty Beyond the Battlefield, African-American Soldiers Fight for Racial Uplift, Citizenship, and Manhood, 1870 to 1920, with Southern Illinois University Press. Welcome, Dr. Latrice Donaldson. Next up is Cardell Oren. Cardell Oren is the Tennessee Executive Director for Stand for Children. Oren has a passion for serving the community and has led efforts as a founding board member of the Hadaloo Theater, Memphis Urban League Young Professionals, and the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change Advisory Board. Oren co-founded New Path, a local political action committee focused on engaging young people in the political process and electing solutions-oriented candidates to office. He continues service as board chair for Freedom Preparatory Academy and serves on the boards of the Hallelu Theater, Over in the Park uh, Conservancy, uh, and Zion Hill uh, Community Project. He has been honored by the April 4th Foundation with their Trailblazer Award. Oren graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a bachelor's of science degree in engineering and computer science with a diff additional emphasis on African-American studies and entrepreneurial management studies. I do believe we have the panel that needs to discuss this issue tonight. Up now. It's Daphne McFerrin to get us started. Okay, well, I'd like to welcome all of you tonight. And first, let me summarize um, our first um, critical race theory event, what it is and what it isn't. And in that event, um, the commentators all agreed, as well as national commentators and those who study critical race theory, the critical race theory is simply not taught in K through 12. Um, it is a legal concept 
started out of law school, Harvard Law School, primarily with Derrick Bell and others, um, to examine a framework. Um, so I'm going to give a definition of critical race theory that is mine, that people have asked me, how could I best explain it? And so critical race theory is a framework for examining, dissecting, and understanding how individuals, America itself, its institutions perpetuate racism, classism, sexism through law, customs, policies, and practices. It's important to note that critical race theory is just not limited to race. It is a framework, so it could be used to analyze gender discrimination, sexism, et cetera. There was a great article in the New York Times uh, on July 27th, 2021, which explained the various uh, frameworks that critical race theory applies. So here's a very simplistic example of how critical race theory would apply to a case decision. So Plessy versus Ferguson was decided in 1896. It's cemented throughout the law of the land, separate but equal. Not equal, but separate. Separate accommodation, separate schools, essentially making African-Americans second-class citizens throughout the nation. So not only did the decision impact the railroad company, which was at issue in the case, but also how African-Americans navigated daily life. If Even if you were a white person and you disagreed with the decision and did not believe in segregation, there were laws in place that even a white person could be, uh, could be prosecuted for, for violating those laws. So it takes a holistic look at how people are cemented in place in terms of how they can navigate or not navigate throughout American life. Critical race theory recognizes that discrimination oppression may not necessarily be intentional on the part of individual, individual actors. So going back to my Plessy versus Ferguson decision, if there was a white person who wanted to integrate his or her facility, they would be prohibited from doing so by law. But nevertheless, the fact that they could not act, could not be fair and equal, would perpetuate discrimination and second class treatment of African-Americans. Now, that is a very, very simplistic explanation of critical race theory. And I want to go and uh, look at the law. So um, I'm going to share my screen. And I copied Tennessee Code Annotated, Section 49.6.10.19. This law, this is the, uh, the codification of the law, of the bill signed into law by Governor Bill Lee on May 25th uh, of this year. So it prohibits certain concepts in instruction, and it's called concepts prohibited from inclusion or promotion in course of instruction. And it provides withholding of state funds upon violation of this law. So I just went through and highlighted, and you can actually look at this yourself by going to TennesseeCourts.gov and pulling up the Tennessee Code and pulling up this section. So, for example, so, for example, it says an individual by virtue of the individual's race or sex you can't teach is inherently privileged are that they are acting in some way that is subconscious. So this, for example, would prohibit the way I read the statute from saying that white privilege exists. Um, you can't uh, teach that an individual uh, bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same sex or race. Um, to me, that calls into question, how do we, I mean, affirmative action is essentially an acknowledgement that there was discrimination in the past. So this is saying that even with that history, the affirmative action acknowledges a history of oppression, which has kept certain people out of the mainstream of American life, that some teaching on that may violate the statute. An individual, you should not teach where an individual will feel discomfort, guilt, or anguish, or another form of psychological distress because of the individual's race. CNN just reported that parents in Williamson County, Tennessee, are stating that some books, including a children's book by Ruby, um, the, um, the, the child who integrated uh, Louisiana schools, um, that in fact, some of the parents are saying that the racial slurs um, made toward her when she was trying to integrate Ruby Bridges, that 
that would that makes white children feel uncomfortable and they should not be taught that, for example, there are white people who were being racist toward this child as she was trying to integrate public school. So uh, that CNN article is posted on our website. Now, number nine is interesting because clearly no one should promote or uh, advocate the overthrow of the United States government. And I can't imagine anyone being taught that K through 12, it's in here, that seems acceptable, but it seems to be directed toward the wrong people. The people who perhaps would have benefited the most from this were those who are at the Capitol on January 6th. So that's an interesting one, but it's there. Um, so you shouldn't promote division or resentment of race based on race, sex, religion, creed, uh, political affiliation, social class. You shouldn't teach that, and this is number 12, that the rule of law does not exist, but instead is a series of power relationships and struggles among racial or other groups. Well, in the 1800s, after the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were passed, but essentially Jim Crow and the period after Reconstruction, the right to vote and many other privileges were simply erased for African-Americans. So the rule of law could be there, but it is not necessarily enforced uh, based upon many relationships and struggles among racial groups. Nevertheless, there is a session, section in this uh, that says, notwithstanding everything uh, before it about what should not be taught, that an instructor can teach the history of an ethnic group based on textbooks and instru instructional materials provided by the state or approved by the state, uh, the state Department of Education. As long as the person is engaging in, they can uh, teach an impartial discussion of controversial aspects of history. Now, impartial is not defined, and uh, I think Dr. Uh, Malden is going to talk about that. And then the teacher can have an impartial instruction on the historical oppression of a particular group of people based upon race, ethnicity, class, nationality, religion. And I assume these sec sections are in here to. Um, soften the other sections are to save this section of the law. But the truth of the matter is what is impartial is up for debate. And what this does do is allow parents and others who are not um, aligned with teaching a fair and accurate and whole, uh, holistic approach to history uh, discrimination in this country to complain about a teacher, that the teacher is not being impartial, that the teacher is uh, hurting the feelings of a child. So as many commentators who have reviewed this statute have said, many of the terms are unclear and what it does do, and this is without a doubt, it creates fear among the people who are to teach in the classroom. And so this has enormous implications for our students, for their learning, and also for producing a country where people are taught to fight for equality and to work with people of different backgrounds to make sure that everyone can reach their full potential and not be discriminated against. So this is the framework of the statute. And again, if you want to uh, take a look at it, it is Tennessee Code Annotated, Section 49.6.10.19. All right, thank you, um, Daphne. Next up, Dr. Courtney Malden. So uh, to, to really build off of what Daphne just shared, I wanted to um, talk about kind of what came from these prohibited concepts when they came down in early August. So as many of you all know, the Tennessee Department of Education released a draft rule titled These Prohibited Concepts in Public Instruction. And that was in conjunction with Section 51 of Public Chapter 493, which was passed the last legislative section, which was known more formally of what people have been calling the anti-CRT bill. And so um, there was a 10-day public comment window that was open 
I suppose, to submit feedback to the department on the contents of the draft that they created. And so um, for me, I really wanted to be able to put agency back in school leaders or school principals' hands, as well as teachers, families, and students, uh, because it was pretty evident that as you read through these concepts, which you all just got kind of a snapshot of, that they were not considered uh, when these were being drafted. So I think it might be helpful to kind of read some of the text again, um, and I'll pull different ones from what we, what we just shared. Um, but I want to also talk about the recommendations that were made and how those recommendations better center um, families, school principals, teachers, and students. And I want to also acknowledge Cardell, who is here, who you all will hear from. Um, these recommendations came about simply because I made a phone call from New York. Um, and while Tennessee is my hometown, um, and these issues are very close to my heart, I found out about these concepts on Twitter. There was a news article that was tweeted out and it was alarming because I thought it might be fake news <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't. And so upon realizing that this was a very real thing, I began to reach out to uh, people in Tennessee like Cardell who could help me get people on the ground together to find a way to resist, but to also respond strategically. And so I'll read a few from the text directly and then share some of those recommendations that might show you how we were wanting to really put agency back into folks who are actually in schools and interacting with schools. So um, one of the, the first things even is that the Tennessee Commissioner of Education, she their original text reads that there's a department review team, which would mean a committee of department employees that we would be appointed by the commissioner herself. And they would review and investigate any necessary appeals or complaints that were filed. Um, and so it was very unclear in that language of who is the review team made up of? Who does it reflect? What perspectives are we going to see reflected here? Because we know that without a diverse representation of people on that committee, if a complaint was then filed on a teacher uh, falsely, right, or inaccurately or misread, um, that that could then steer decision making to go a particular way that would actually harm the teacher. And then, of course, harm the district if funds were uh, being threatened to be withheld from schools and districts. And so one of the recommendations that we made, and when I say we, I mean collectively, so not just myself, um, but people in Memphis, people in Nashville, um, educators and professors from all over and parents and students even who wanted to weigh in on what this process could and should look like. Uh, we asked that the department review team appointed by the commissioner include at least two parents from the classroom of the teacher with whom the complaint is filed. Uh, we know that by having some of these gaps and holes in language, that if we don't fill those in, right, then this could, again, go in a direction that we don't want it to. And so we asked that the department review team reflect um, diverse stakeholders that were not limited to parents, community leaders, and students, but also representing those three grand divisions of Tennessee, so West Tennessee, Middle, as well as East Tennessee. As it relates to reporting um, and investigating these prohibited concepts, currently uh, the language it's a lot, so I won't read it all, um, but there is talk of the instructional materials that are developed and used in the teaching um, in classrooms as it stands. And so we wanted to urge the department to provide a universal review guide or a rubric even for schools and public charter schools and the local review committees that are granted authority to actually have some consistency, some uniformity and cohesiveness because there's no way to promote fairness with these gaps in language. And so Daphne talked about that earlier, but I think it's more um, urgent than we realize because these gaps leave room for lots of error and lots of harm to be done to teachers and especially thinking about teachers of color who are simply teaching historical fact or truth. And then finally, um, I think it's important to talk about there is, um, I wouldn't call it silver lining, but there is the area of early resolution of complaints that could be filed against teachers um, or school districts. And so the original text states that um, public charter schools and LEAs are encouraged to work collaboratively with parents, teachers, and other employees to resolve these concerns as quickly as possible. But after a complaint has been filed and before any written documentation has been submitted, there is not an opportunity, opportunity to really resolve um, the issue early. And so we wanted to ask or urge rather the Department of Education to allow autonomy of school leaders and principals and teachers to really determine a collaborative approach within their schools um, to reach an early resolution before a complaint is actually filed and submitted and potentially on a teacher's record, uh, which again, instills a lot of fear in teachers to not be able to teach the ways that they normally just might teach. Um, and I think 
the thing that I'll close with here since my time is running short is that um, while we were wanting to really put autonomy back into school leaders and teachers and families' hands, um, by having just early resolution and allowing the teachers and the principals the autonomy to resolve it in their own schools, we've had to contend with this kind of stuff for a very long time. So we're not um, unfamiliar with backlash um, of teaching about historical truths as it relates to Black history, um, as it relates to segregation and all of these different things, right? And so there's always been um, innovation. And so these prohibited concepts were a little terrifying, I think, because they kind of erased any opportunity for teachers to find a workaround. And so we wanted to be really clear in our language and what we constructed so that there is room for teachers to still teach authentically and to even have supplemental materials that um, might talk about these topics. But that doesn't mean that the teacher is inherently responsible for forcing guilt onto a child for talking about historical truths and facts. So um, I'll end there. All right, thank you, Dr. Malden. And next up is Dr. Latrice Donaldson. Hey, thank you so much, um, Dr. Malden. Thank you. That was a wonderful um, <laughs> way to 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 frame everything. Um, I think that uh, so I'll be taking it from the uh, historical context and the historical perspective in regards to um, the implications, right? Uh, in omitting any kind of discussion about race. So literally the founding of this country, the document that, you know, everyone um, conservatives alike hold to be this um, divine um, piece of legislation, the constitution, it begins with a uh, language that frames people of African descent as being three fifths of a person. Right. And so what what these people are trying to do in regards to um, limiting what um, is taught in K through 12 is very bizarre because then you can't even fully teach American history. The fact is, is that um, from the founding, the beginning of this country, uh, with the arrival of the first uh, Europeanists to uh, arrive in North America, um, there was oppression of people of color, whether it was indigenous Americans um, and then uh, um, the um, Afri enslaved Africans and then uh, proceeding to um, African-Americans. So the the fact is, is that these um, figures want to create this like type of amnesia, if you will, or historical amnesia in thinking about um, teaching uh or are trying to stop teaching um, critical race theory. Um, Daphne began the talk with um, the Plessy versus Ferguson decision. And I think uh, it's a great way to tie into this, um, the legacy of um, America's racism, because it was the historical, um, America's uh, racism, America's apartheid laid the framework for the Nazis, for South African apartheid, for various um, different, um, for Australia's um, racist legislation against the um, indigenous uh, or Aboriginal people in Australia and New Zealand. And what you have is that um, America is trying to hide its, um, it's, I guess you say historical um, footprint in regards to oppression, but the rest of the world is going in the opposite direction. The rest of the world is actually going forward with acknowledging um, its uh, behavior in oppressive and racist um, legislation and um, history. And so it's really quite bizarre to look at um, the, uh, the direction that people are trying to, in a state like Texas, where I live, um, the legislation went into effect on September 1st, so that K through 12 can't teach it. But, um, you know, as uh, everyone has said, no one really in K through 12 is teaching critical race theory. What they're teaching is American history. And Unfortunately, apparently it makes white people uncomfortable to deal with the long-term effects of um, and seeing and learning about the history that makes them uncomfortable, right? Um, reframing who George Washington was, right? Yes, he was this person who um, 
uh, led the United States during the American Revolution, but he also was a person who wore um, dentures made from human teeth that was made from enslaved people. Um, Thomas Jefferson, right, uh, did author the Declaration of Independence, but he also was a slave owner who had a, a non-consensual relationship with Sally Hemings. These things are fact, and the fact that they are trying to um, water it down, you know, in teaching here in Texas, I'm learning how watered down Texas students, uh, the effects of these textbooks that Texas um, redid, where they watered down discussions of slavery, they watered down um, and completely created this myth around Texas history. And when they come to my classroom and I tell them and I ask them questions and I expect them to know certain things, they don't know the truth. And it's a, just a grave disservice because when they go out into the world, you have a situation like what happened on January 6th, where attorneys are explaining to their clients that what they did was treasonous. And if they actually understood the Constitution and actually knew anything about the history of this country, they would have known that what they were doing was treasonous. But because what you end up having now is uh, you're raising a generation of people um, that... Uh, um, are not familiar with the history of their own country, that it is unfortunately going to lead to, um, I think, scary as it may sound, more incidents where um, people uh, uh, are going to react um, violently and storm the, the Capitol building and whatnot and um, having to deal with the consequences of being uneducated and not understanding their history because if it makes you uncomfortable, imagine how it makes African-Americans. It's not like learning about slavery is easy for Black people either. I, I really don't understand um, this, uh, this obsession with, oh, the, the kids are uncomfortable. Well, there's a lot of things in life that will make you uncomfortable. And learning truth will be uncomfortable. Growing pains is called growing pains because it's going to be painful. So um, learning the truth about America's history uh, is um, very important um, in raising, uh, you know, civically minded um, citizens, but denying them that truth is going to simply raise a generation of ignorant um, citizens who feel it's their right and their privilege to storm the Capitol building and then not understand why they're going to jail for it. Um, so I'll stop there um, and uh, pass it on to uh, Cardell. <laughs> what a wonderful segue there, Dr. Donaldson. Thank you. And next up, Brother Cardell Oren. What's going on, man? <laughs> Doing good. Thank you, Andre and everybody else on the panel. Uh, such wonderful folks. I feel great to, to be just in this company. I'm the least educated uh, here, so I'm just happy y'all let me hop in. And I was gonna, you know, touch on a couple of uh, of concepts, but what everybody has said and buried right in the middle of these prohibited concepts. And every time I say that, it disturbs me to think that we're even talking about prohibited concepts when it comes to to education and what is truthful in history. But Everybody has kind of touched on it, and it's right in the middle of what are considered uh, prohibited concepts, where it says an individual, a prohibited concept is something where an individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or another form of psychological distress because of the individual's race or sex. And that, you know, the rest of these things, as other panelists have talked about, are kind of window dressing to this one piece that's buried in the middle that says, we don't want to feel any discomfort or guilt or anguish. And to Latrice's point, you know, uh, people of color who have been in classes across history of our country have felt discomfort, anguish, maybe not guilt, anguish, and multiple forms of psychological distress, I would say, uh, because of their race and uh, in, in being in class. And the way that we know historically, uh, we have not received an accurate uh, education in history uh, throughout our times. I mean, many of us who, who, are, who are by age, middle age, can go back 
uh, to uh, just to our childhood and know that we learned a lot more about history uh, in our later years in college and high school and, you know, and after that, uh, then we learned actually in school about the truthfulness and what is accurate history. And so in Tennessee, where even before this law was passed, I believe just when it was uh, kind of getting started, there was a teacher in Blountville, Tennessee, who was fired and in part uh, from teaching and utilizing a, an essay from Todd and Hasse Coates uh, as, you know, the uh, the the um, the riot at, at the Capitol went down. Uh, he was trying to identify a way to communicate with his with his students uh, and utilize this. And again, you know, and taught and previously taught about anti-racism and utilized ways of critical thought to engage his students and get them to think uh, uh, reflectively and about their community and in ways that uh, even he had not learned as he was growing up. And part of what the director of schools who uh, who fired him upheld the firing and then the board upheld the firing uh, responded in terms of the reasons that he had fired home or the reasons that he hadn't was that uh, he said uh, in Sullivan County schools and Sullivan County schools and I in no way condone racism of any kind. So it again becomes this place where we can broadly talk about racism and being against racism. But when we get to the specifics that are in our history, the specifics that our children uh, need to learn uh, to be active and engaged residents in, in our communities and in our country, this is where these laws uh, push back. And I would encourage folks to find different ways to think of, uh, to even talk about them than saying anti-CRT laws, because as uh, the previous panel that the Hooks Institute had, as uh, the other uh, panelists have said, this is not critical race theory. And none of this is. Uh, it is anti-history. It is anti-truth in history. It is, uh, you know, pro keep discomfort away from people who might feel uncomfortable. Uh, and, and instead of, of encouraging us to engage, if over the years, even as, as a large part of this is not just about racism, but sexism. So even as men in our community, we have to think of ways that uh, might, not make us un might not make us the most comfortable to consider what are the ways that sexism plays a role in our community. I might not want to engage with Pearl Clegg or Audre Lorde or any number of uh, of feminist or womanist writers, uh, but it's necessary to understand and become uncomfortable to reconsider and think about how we move forward and engage. So the things that, that I think that, that we need to, to encourage and include and, and be sure of is that we've got a responsibility to provide our students with truthful fact-based history and that teaching stu students uh, that racism is wrong. And there's been national surveys uh, that have been done that have affirmed that most people, the majority of our country, believes that students uh, should learn a thorough, accurate, and fact-based account of American history. That it's important and they believe that racism is widespread and harmful to society. And that schools have a responsibility to teach students that racism is wrong. So how do we do this when in our state we are saying, that uh, you could be up for a fine or your teacher licensure uh, revoked if you err on any side of what we deem as impartial, quote unquote, impartial uh, conveyance of history to our students. And again, in some of these areas, I think as Latrice touched on, it's, it's difficult to think of how you teach about the enslavement and the kidnapping of African people in an impartial way just as it would be challenging to think about how you educate about World War II and Nazis and Hitler in an impartial way. How do you do that uh, when you are trying to relate what are challenging issues uh, that we have seen in our country's history and in our world history? And we've seen communities, just as in these schools, uh, start to reconsider what are the broad impacts of racism and its ramifications, uh, and then start to try to respond to that in trauma-informed and responsive ways, in ways that look at diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's so important as our country is becoming even more and more diverse, as we've seen in the recent census uh, that, that we've just gone through the 10-year census. We can see 
Our country is becoming more diverse and we have to uh, help to raise children uh, who can be active participants in our society and moving our country towards a better uh, place. And then the last thing is around that I wanted to touch on is around what this means for teachers. Uh, we're saying that we don't trust teachers to impart an education, to think about critical ways to engage their, the students that they teach. And we're doing it at the worst possible time when we have a teacher shortage that we see in our community here in Memphis and Shelby County and in our state and across the country. And we are challenging teachers and saying, OK, we're going to monitor what you're teaching. We're going to monitor how you're teaching these things in, a, in an overt way when you're really trying to impart truthful education to, to children. Uh, why would teachers uh, continue? How does that not increase the impact on the teacher shortage that we see when we're not really thinking about the ways that uh, the teachers can, can play an active role in developing the young people and developing the future of, of our country? And so all of these things are the pieces that come together. And, and just to touch on briefly in my, my last piece about the, the impact of this, that this state law says that uh, on the first instance of a so-called so, uh, so -called violation, uh, you can, uh, a district or a charter school could receive up to a million dollar fine. And as they go up each level, as it goes from the first violation, so-called violation, to the second, to the third, to the fourth, each adds a million, so a million, two million, three million, four million, five million dollars could be the impact of this on taking money further away from our children and education that we so desperately need right now. And in addition, that piece that I mentioned about the possibility that teachers licensure could be revoked or suspended, uh, these are just threats that we don't need at this time and we can figure out a better way to engage and move forward as a community. Thank you. And thank you, Brother Cardale. What a wonderful panel. And now I want to bring back the panel. Um, we do have some time for Q&A. Before we get to any questions, I want to ask any of the panelists, would they like to um, say a little bit more, something that they wanted to get in, but due to time constraints, you couldn't get in. So if we can have the panel panelists come back, uh, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to one another uh, or to um, add a little bit more on your presentation. So, Andre, I'd like to um, just um, insert one thing. The statute mm -hmm. in Section C provides that the commissioner, the Tennessee Department of Education um, commissioner in this case, um, will um, withhold funds in any amount determined by the commissioner. So the proposed rule and the way this is administrative law. So the Tennessee legislature uh, and the governor signs the bill into law. Then the Department of Education proposes a rule mm -hmm. and asks for the public to comment on that rule. The comments were due August 11th. Uh, 2021, and the comments are what Courtney uh, was um, explaining her uh, and other people's insights into how this uh, new law uh, impacts classrooms and the public's comment to that. In the proposed rule, not in the statute itself, in the proposed rule, as Cardell said, it sets out these, these fines, these proposed fines. Um, and so Cardell uh, stated correctly that um, the first violation is up to one million. Uh, the second one is up to two million. Third, up to three million, four million, five million. So for already strapped school districts, um, this is a catastrophic event to have these kinds of fines. We do not know, and maybe Courtney has some insight on it, what ultimately I looked on uh, the website and tried to find uh, whether or not there was a final rule issued yet, and I haven't seen one. Um, so, so all of these things are being commented on by the by the public. But nevertheless, even the proposed rule by the Tennessee Department of Education and the fines proposed by the commissioner are extremely troublesome, and also in a time when where school districts are so strapped for funds, it doesn't make any sense. The only people being harmed are the children, you know, mm -hmm. who 
have fewer resources, the teachers who have fewer resources to work with if a school district is fined for an alleged violation of the law. Right. Dr. Like Marvin, oh, oh, go ahead, Cordell. Yeah, I'm sorry, did I jump off you, Cordell? <laughs> um, go ahead, go ahead. I just wanted to add one thing because I, I do think in the law too, you know, one of the, I will say good parts of the draft that they have so far, to the extent that there's good, <laughs> is that uh, one, it has to be a, a parent, a student, or a staff member potentially at the school uh, where they are making the complaint. So it can't come from outside and just say there's a complaint here. So that, that's a piece of it. That is, it, it does have some form of local uh, first round of control. Um, so that the the school board, the LEA school board or the charter school board would consider this and could decide and then it could be it would be appealed to the state. Um, and then the uh, the other piece is 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 just then, you know, once it gets to the state, kind of all bets are off to this, this panel that I think Courtney mentioned uh, that to some degree uh, there's a concern about it getting to the state. But I am actually. Uh, fairly concerned about uh, young people of color who are in rural and suburban areas probably more than I am some of the urban areas. We know that if it gets appealed to probably our school board or some of the charter school boards that we know of, like, it probably will turn down. They can appeal to the state. But in some of these areas where there might not be as much oversight or as, as many people of color in the, in the community, in mm -hmm. Blountville, Tennessee, where we've already seen it, in Williamson County, uh, there could be some of these uh, ramifications that happen for teachers and for schools or school leaders in those districts that nobody sees and nobody's tracking because it happens out of the light of day. Right, right. Dr. Malden, you want to get in? Yeah, I mean, I think you captured it so well, Cardell. I, I think that the concern is definitely that people are forgetting that we have students of color in these districts that are suburban and Aside of that, we also have a, a, a teaching force that's 98 percent white um, across all schools, suburban, urban. Right. And so there are teachers who are actually in support of this and who are fine with it. Right. And so there's been a lot of, again, underhanded things that we've seen historically that has happened with schools that have set out to harm black teachers and that have set out to harm teachers of color. And so I think that um, me mentioning this need for autonomy within the school and having school leaders and having a collective of teachers who are able to internally handle this is, is much better than what they currently have proposed and in place. Um, I also wanted to mention that from those prohibited concepts, because um, it came up a lot in the panel about um, what a prohibited concept is. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Cardell, but about feeling discomfort or guilt or anguish. And I feel like it's really important to just name this, that learning is an affective thing. So you're going to feel something. And I think Latrice also talked about this, but you can't control nor influ influence a student response um, simply by teaching historical fact. And so even if it's perceived as controversial, controversial, the teacher has no responsibility for what a student might feel. And the goal isn't to make students feel um, guilt or anguish. And I think it was also mentioned here that this is more about uh, what our students of color and our black students have been experiencing in classrooms daily. And in Tennessee, especially in Texas uh, and other Southern states, um, there have definitely been reenactments of slavery with, with white teachers where the black students have been those asked to perform being a slave. And we didn't see anything come down for that. Right. And so now we have these concepts that are actually preventing us from teaching the truth when we've had things like that going on for years. And that's the real concern. So I think that. Um, that this is a backlash in many ways. And I don't know if we've named that on the panel just yet, but we know that this is a backlash in many ways, I think, in response to the progress that we were making after this summer with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and people having to commit and see the ugly truth um, of racism in this world. And now we're here on the other side, which this is often how it goes. So that's all. We do have some questions from our um, Facebook viewers. But before we get to that, I just want to ask one question, and maybe this will go to you, Daphne, because when this law was first being debated and then when it finally got signed, many people um, said that even if it does become law, it's an unconstitutional law. So what is what is 
what is that? Do you think that, you know, if if someone challenges this law, it would be found unconstitutional? OK, now that's a guess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so ultimately, yes, it's yeah, it's Man, a lot of people since since it was only unconstitutional, a lot of people did not even, you know, think think about it until, you know, of course, people started to put it into place. But go ahead. OK, um, so first of all, just looking at it, the statute itself, it's vague, overbroad and um, on a First Amendment basis presents uh, a whole host of issues with respect to, to free speech. However, um, Laws like this are interpreted by the courts. The courts are appointed in the federal system, obviously, by uh, recommended by your congressional uh, official, congressional representative, moves through the Senate Judiciary Committee and approved by the president of the United States for federal district court judges. So hopefully someone will take a unbiased approach to this and reach a decision, but there is no guarantee because judges are like everybody else. <laughs> they sometimes come with ideological positions. Mm -hmm. um, this is, however, not the first time Tennessee has been um, on the edge of enacting a law that is problematic. Uh, we go back to 1925 with the Scopes Monkey Trial Mm -hmm. where Tennessee enacted a law banning the teaching of evolution in schools. <laughs> and uh, John Scopes challenged the law. He is what we call a test plaintiff. He voluntarily agreed to violate the law. I mean, it's a complicated story, in part because he wanted to bring publicity to Dayton, Tennessee. But he agreed to put himself out there. And um, the ACLU stepped into the case. And so ultimately, uh, Drew, uh, Scopes was convicted of violating the law. He paid the fine, but the case was overturned on a technicality. And then Tennessee kind of gave up and said, oh, yeah, this law didn't make any sense. Let's move on. Right. So here, what's going to happen eventually is that someone will agree to be a test case where they purposely violate the law and then have it go through the courts. The other um avenue is someone will do their very best not to violate the law, but will be found in violation of the law through this process. And the really sad part about it is that either avenue is very expensive for the per person who is trying to do the right thing. It's a loss of job, loss of income, a taint on their teaching record. It involves and impacts their family. So someone is going to, who inadvertently violates the law, going to go through a lot of grief, grief and uh, financial turmoil through the courts. And so people who are doing their very best to be uh, great teachers and teach history and to try to keep, uh, try to teach where the students are informed and prepared to be uh, upstanding citizens and valuable citizens to our century are going to be penalized under this law. So yeah. I don't know how this is gonna play out, but it's gonna play out one or two ways through the, the uh, test case or through the person who inadvertently violates the law. All right. Let's get to some of these uh, questions from our viewers. The first question is, Shelby County Schools has forbidden the use of materials outside of the adopted curriculum materials. Um, this person writes, I am leading a seminar with music educator residents, student teachers right now. How can they have agency in their own classrooms in selecting materials such as a repertoire for their classrooms? I guess the question is, how can a person um, have their own agency in selecting material they think will reach the students uh, maybe even better than the prescribed materials? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> You know, I would I, just say, oh, ahead. No, no, I'll, I'll go. And then, Cardell, we can probably, because <laughs> I'm sure we can probably build off each other on this one. But the reality is, and I was also a teacher in Tennessee, um, and I think the reality is that we've never had this curriculum that just reflected us as whole humans in the first place. It's not like we, I mean, there, a lot of our textbooks come out of Texas, and I, there definitely was a um, textbook material that misrepresented what slavery was, but there was always opportunity for the teacher to have to reframe 
and talk about the reality of what was happening. And sometimes this wasn't just on the teacher, but also students speaking up because they know the truth from home, right? And so I think similarly, um, when we think about supplemental materials and what that looks like, an agency and those being in relationship with one another, I think there's still opportunity. I think the agency is still what we have. And so I think there's still opportunity to present supplemental materials that are not reflected in the curriculum because what we've needed is not ever really been there in the first place. And so being able to provide alternatives like media, like blog articles, to have students have their own dialogue, you're facilitating as the instructor and the teacher, but you're providing materials and you're not necessarily responsible for how students take up that material. They engage in their own dialogue. They are civic agents, right? And so I think that um, we can... I hope we can lean on the side of supplementing our material where we can right now until this thing turns around. All right. Cordell, you want to add something? Yeah, Courtney was right on that because I I would like to build on what she said, because I think that's that's true. I know flipping through my daughter's uh, like social studies and history book from fourth and fifth grade. I was just flipping thinking, okay, yeah, we need to talk about this and this and this because these aren't the right context. Um, that there are these pieces. And I think that as a community, and that's, you know, I think that as a community of of parents, of community members, of educators, part of what we should be talking to our school district about, to our charter school boards about, is the affirmation that it is okay to continue to focus on teaching children in the best way that we think educators can to provide the fullest context available. If we did something similar, if the school board, which they could, the administration could come out Similar to to DAs around the country that have said, we're just not going to prosecute these lesser offenses, right? If the school board came out and said, hey, if you get brought up on these charges, complaints, we just not going to, we're going to be okay with it. And there was an (laughs) affirmation that at least in this first level, that you are supported and affirmed in delivering the education that is is necessary uh, for, for truth and education. Uh, then like we'll take on the state together and that's might be where the lawsuit comes. But I think that that's one of the things that we could do locally uh, to, to support educators. Question. Just out of curiosity, where does Tennessee rank in regards to education? Because it's right, very right. interesting that it's these particular Southern schools that are doing this because um, there are other schools that are going in the opposite direction. Right. And mm-hmm. not only that, these students will be ill prepared. For example, if they're going to do AP exams, right? You take an AP exam, they're graded by a bunch of college professors. I've done this. And you're like, you don't even know what you're talking about. And you want to go to college. You want to go to an Ivy League school. You want to go to the University of Georgia. You can go to the University of Texas. And you think you can go to University of Texas with the history department there. It's one of the best in the country and talk about, oh, slavery, that race. What do you, I don't what do you mean that there was race involved with slavery? I don't understand. Like, no, that's not going to fly. They're good good grief. AP is getting ready to introduce an AP exam, uh, AP history, um, African-American history course. Like everyone's going the opposite direction, but Tennessee, Texas, they're going to go, no, we don't want to talk about race. No, it's not real. I don't know. It's, it's a very bizarre thing. As a college professor, it's very bizarre to, um, to have to watch this and realize that, we have to, I as a professor, I have to deal with these people when they come to college and have no idea what, um, what really happened in American history. And they are angry because people lied to them. And I'm just like, well, don't be mad at me. I'm just telling you what happened. Wow. Um, I think we got time for at least one more question. And this is actually to Dr. Malden. Someone is asking um, to you, what's the potential impact of this on teachers of color? I will not uh, be the only one to respond on this because I don't want to take up all the talk time. I have to say one more thing, though, to the music educator. I do have to say this I because I, I see that you said that Shelby County Schools has forbidden the use of these materials. When I say agency and, and um, supplemental materials, sometimes even a song. We know the songs send a lot of messages, right? Like there's there is room. I think there's a lot of fear to tell us that there is no room, but there is room. So I just wanted to to clarify what I meant about supplemental materials, mm-hmm. because forbidden or not, um, there's room there. Um, to answer the question about the potential impact on teachers of color, um, I think that's a very complicated answer, which is why I would like for someone else on the panel to also share. Um, historically, 
Um, we've seen a mass displacement of Black teachers with things like Brown v. Board. Um, and so a part of my thinking is that um, when certain things come down legally, um, even if it's presented as if it's in the best interest of a particular group, there is always a cost. And typically uh, we carry those costs. And so as I think about uh, teachers of color who are trying to do work that is socially just or responsive to the students in front of them, obviously this makes it harder, right? But again, as, as I return to this point of agency and posing critical thinking questions, taking different types of field experiences and field trips, um, that's I think that's what teachers are going to have to do. But I do think that teachers of color have always been and continue to be innovative um, because we've always had to figure this thing out and we have to figure out how we supplement the curriculums that we're given. So I think there's a, a impact in terms of um, are they less are they more likely to be fined? Maybe because I mean, we've seen that already happen. Right. Just when this came down in August. But I also want to open up space for what you all think um, on the panel. I think that there are multiple impacts. That could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, anybody else want to uh, add a comment to that? I think I would just add that I th I think this is you know there's the potential for there to be an impact to to uh, educators of color mainly if if we think if we think that they're the ones who are more likely to have these context field like truthful right. education pieces, but really mm -hmm. one of the harms and like as Courtney said is that this is harmful to educators of goodwill You're right. and, <laughs> and genders uh, and sex. And so, you know, the that's part of the challenge of this is that it's, it's, it's against anybody who wants people to think critically to the point that it might make somebody uncomfortable within that education experience. And as I think people on the panel have said, people in the chat have said, if we're not educating towards some level of discomfort for somebody, <laughs> like what are we doing? <laughs> and also, we just give a shout out to to one of the partnerships that Stanford Children's is part of a national partnership. I put it in the chat. Uh, learn for, from history, learnfromhistory.org, uh, mm -hmm. where uh, they're getting partners together to really push across the country towards the the truth filled uh, educate history education that we really need, uh, and the pushback against these efforts everywhere. That's going back to what Dr. Donaldson was saying. It seems like uh, other states and other groups of people, other institutions, other agencies are moving in one direction, while others are moving in a total different opposite direction that is going to um, leave us with a whole lot of problems. Well, you know what? Look at the time. Time flies when you're having fun. I want to thank the panel tonight for um, coming and um, being a part of this um, wonderful panel and this wonderful discussion. We want you to continue with the conversation by making comments in the Facebook comment section. Um, this will be up in a couple of days on our YouTube channel. You can make comments there as well, and you can ask your questions uh, as well, and you can even have a dialogue. Uh, as well on these many different platforms. Follow us on Twitter at Hooks Institute, at Hooks Institute. And again, please um, go um, to our webpage, uh, memphis.edu backslash Ben Hooks, and get all of the information um, that you need concerning the Hooks Institute and all of the things that we're doing. And one more last thing. Also, sign up. Um, for our newsletter, sign up for um, um, the, uh, our um, mailers and so you can get the events and all of the programming that's going on at Hooks as well. We are so excited about the things that's going on, not only this semester, but next semester and all the things that are going on um, with the Hooks Institute. For instance, Coming up in a couple of weeks, October the 19th, another Facebook Live event, Combating the HIV Epidemic in Memphis. It'll start at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Panelists here will discuss HIV stigma and discrimination in the African-American community, living with HIV and ways to reduce the risk of getting HIV and other STIs. The panel will be moderated 
by a Hooks Academic Research Fellow, Dr. Shamika Hamlin Palmer. She is a clinical assistant professor, Department of Healthcare Leadership, right here at the University of Memphis. We are again so grateful and thankful for our panelists, Daphne McFerrin, Dr. Courtney Malden, Dr. Latrice Donald, Donaldson, and my good friend, uh, <laughs> my good friend Cardell Owen. So thank you again. Please share this um, post, share this video, and let us know by your comments and by your questions in the comment section. Until next time, see you. <laughs>